Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series, and it is a question and answer from people in London, presented by Jesus on the 13th of July, 2013, in Waterloo, London, UK. All right, well, I think the uh, people who wanted to ask personal questions uh, or ask questions generally have won the day for the next part of the session. So I'm all yours for <laughs> about an hour and a half. <laughs> okay. If we come down first and then we'll go out the back to the guys. It's on. Uh, I think I know why I'm going to ask this question. Okay, fire away. I just realised that I was... Seeking some approval from yeah. you. Uh. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but there Not is another part of this question that I would like to probably get an sure. answer. Um, with the, it, it, it had to do with the pleasure and joy um, of uh, the loving use of free will. Yeah. Um, I think, is, how do you distinguish between the genuine joy and pleasure of uh, acting in love or just receiving pleasure from As an the, addiction? Uh, yes. Mm. No. I don't know. Well, that's maybe how I I'm to, Maybe I'm totally wrong, but it, um, it looks as if some spirits were rewarding me yes. through their addictions yeah. being met. And yes. I, if Which you don't happens. mind, I'll explain. Yep. Um, I've been uh, doing quite a lot of uh, work in the past months. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite a lot of pleasure and rewards mm -hmm. because I thought I was working a lot mm -hmm. until, and in the process, I think, I think, I'm not sure I've met my soulmate. <laughs> and then uh, it all stopped um, when I started working on my fear of spirits. And literally, the n in the next hour, everything went down the drain and it's still extremely hard, and it's been months since then. Yep. Um, so I'm doubting now that all the joy and rewards I had received mm -hmm. was not just them rewarding me, mm -hmm. and uh, every good news I thought I had was mm. just... Was a figment uh, of imagination, it seems now. Well, it was f just fake, yeah. actually. Because so I've realized that I, I'm just a puppet, because every time now I, I, I know that uh, once I've triggered them, they... So it's as if they, they were quite happy with me working on whatever yep. that I thought was quite important, actually. But when I started uh, coming a bit closer t to them, <laughs> hop. Uh, so, well, it's not very funny, actually. <laughs> no, it's not funny. <laughs> Let's look at what's going on. Um, for the majority of us, when we begin this process, we don't realise that the majority of times we think we're receiving pleasure or joy, we're actually having our addictions met. And unfortunately, spirits are very hooked into you retaining having your addictions met because that's how they get their addictions met. So there is a codependency that develops between spirits and ourselves with regards to addictions. And a, and a spirit will under pretty much all circumstances, if they are earthbound spirits, and there's 20 billion earthbound spirits around the earth at any one point in time, they will, if they wish, use their, your addictions to get their addictions met. So, for example, with regard to your fears, if you're suppressing your fears, certain fears that you have, and one fear you have is that you'll never be with your soulmate, right? and those kind of fears are often frequently the case with every person you know that we're worried that the that the person we're with isn't the i what we view as our ideal and uh, and so what we finish up doing is we finish up having a lot of these unexpressed fears and spirits know that if all we need to do is, all they need to do is give you nice feelings about those particular fears to make them go away and you'll pretty much do what they want you to do they know that and in that moment, you might receive what you would call joy or pleasure in that moment. However, if the long-term results are suffering or pain, 
if the long-term results are suffering or pain, then that indicates that the original pleasure was not driven by real soul-based joy. It was driven by an addiction. So whenever you have something that you initially feel is pleasurable, but in the long term it turns out painful, one of the things that you can look at is this issue of what's going on. And for the majority of us, we are addicted. We have a heap of addictions. Wanting our pleasures to be fulfilled when many of our pleasures are not actually pleasurable in the long run. You will actually feel the harmful effect of the addiction in the long run. In other words, you'll eventually feel the pain and suffering that comes from following something that initially was pleasurable but event eventually ends up quite painful. Now, if I give you some examples of this in terms of day-to-day -day living. When a, a person normally gets their cup of tea or coffee in the morning, they initially believe that uh, this is a pleasurable experience. Yeah? And they feel that every time they have their cuffer, that feels good, that feels good for them, makes them feel alive, makes them feel a number of different things. But the majority of people who become addicted to tea and coffee and even just minor substances like this that are legal to take, and when they pass into the spirit world, they no longer can have that addiction met. In other words, you can't drink a cup of tea in the spirit world. And you can't drink a cup of coffee in the spirit world. And so then what happens is they, they're going, where's my cup of tea? Where's my cup of coffee? And now, all of a sudden, the so-called pleasurable experience that they had all of their life now becomes very painful. They have a lot of these addictions, physical addictions I'm talking about in this case, not, not in this case, I'm talking about all sorts of addictions here. But in the example I'm giving is a physical addiction. We have a physical addiction that drives our behaviour. And when we meet that physical addiction, we feel a level of pleasure. But what is the results in the long run is the question. Now, a person who drinks a lot of coffee and a, or a lot of tea in the long run, generally they'll probably put on some weight. They'll generally um, find stress very difficult to deal with without their tea or coffee. They'll find every time they feel stressed, they'll go to a tea or a coffee in order to alleviate their stress and so forth. And this is an indication that it's an addiction being met that's causing their so-called pleasure rather than just the pleasure of having that particular thing, whatever that thing is. Let's look at another example. The average male on the planet under 30 years of age would believe that having a long series of uh, multiple relationships with different women is a good thing. All right? By the time, if he continues that lifestyle until he's 80 years of age, he'll find himself to be very lonely and have a lot of people very angry with him. That's the long-term effect of that addiction that he thought was pleasurable right at the beginning that's not pleasurable at the end of his life. That's an indication that it was an addiction that he was looking after when he wanted a long seri a series of relationships with different women. It wasn't something that was a part of his desires in a pure sense. And we could bring up lots and lots of illustrations like that. Even from an emotional perspective, we can bring up these illustrations of what happens in terms of what you believe somebody is giving you. For example, if uh, many people are addicted to feeling good about themselves because they actually feel quite bad about themselves. And so what, the, what they do is they allow other people to pro project at them that they're good people. And in fact, they only spend time with other people who think they're good. Right? Now, in this process, they get to feel good about themselves. But if you put them in isolation, away from the normal people who give them all of these feelings, they go downhill very rapidly in terms of how they feel about themselves. That's an indication that what the so-called pleasure was, was just an addictive experience that they were looking for. So what I'm suggesting to you is that every single addiction that you satisfy, that initially you believe brings you pleasure and joy, is in the long run going to create the pain and suffering. And the pain and suffering is telling you that the original so-called pleasure and joy wasn't real. It was just an addiction. It was an addiction being satisfied. Now, spirits want you to satisfy your addictions. Particularly, when I say spirits, I'm talking now about the earthbound spirits who have yet to actually leave the earth 
And the reason why they're yet to leave the earth is because they don't want to go to the spirit world where most of their addictions can't be met. And so what they do is they stay on earth and they influence people to do things on earth so that they can share in the addictive feelings and still have many of their feelings met through this process. And so they will leverage any one of your personal emotional injuries in order to have their particular addictions met. And this is what's been going on with yourself. They've been leveraging your own emotional injuries that you're not aware of yet or that you don't want to face yet and using them to get their addictions met. And that will always in the long term create pain and suffering not only for you but also for them in the long run. With, uh, with regards to addictions, uh, that's why I, I started my question uh, by saying that I think I'm seeking some of your approval is because I actually uh, I thought I went to uh, quite great lengths to actually work on my addictions because I mm -hmm. went twice to the desert two weeks on my own without food, uh, cigarette, coffee and means of communication yeah. just to fight my addictions. As a result, I, I gave up smoking and drinking coffee. So. Yeah. Uh, half of my addictions, let's say. No, no, that's not half of your addictions. No, I mean, the ones that In I... In fact, to be honest I, I with had you... I had set myself the goal of food, uh, yeah. computer, smoking and coffee. Yeah. So now, I what gave you've up just smoking listed, and coffee. But what you've just listed is all your physical addictions. Yes, absolutely. At least to start with that. With well, the, they mean the, almost nothing in comparison to your emotional addictions. Your emotional addictions are much higher and greater than your physical addictions. In fact, all of your physical addictions are driven by your emotional addictions. So when you remove a physical addiction, while you may feel like you've addressed the issue, you haven't actually addressed the issue yet. You only can address the issue by addressing the emotion that drove the physical addiction. That's why I went to the desert and I thought, I won't eat, so I'll see what it feels like being very hungry and very angry about it. <laughs> so, well, I, I worked a lot in the desert. I mean, lots of fear and shame and stuff came up. And I was, and as I good. had nothing else to do because I was on my own virtually, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I worked on that all the time, yeah. twice. So it was now almost I need to, a month. I need to all. stop you. Yeah. Because can you feel your anger at me even just saying that to you? Because I can. I'm not telling you that I'm through, but I'm just trying to, with regards to, to this joy and pleasure, because after that, I received, I thought I received some very some nice up. answers yep. to my questions, and yep. now I'm doubting that I, they were any answers at all. Oh, I agree. I would doubt. I would doubt that they were any answers at all. Because you still have the emotional addictions in place. And while those emotional addictions in place, that's the focus. That you, the spirits all work on your emotional addictions. That's what they're focused on. They see them as colours coming out of your spirit form that they can manipulate and control because they know that you will be manipulated and controlled by certain things. And it's interesting that when I point that out to you, the first feeling you have is anger, which you still have if you're honest with yourself right as I'm speaking. And this is, the, this is telling you that there are underlying fears that you have that you've yet to even go near and face. And you want it to all be over in a few weeks. No, no, that's not true. No, it is. Well, no, I, I'm not, no, it's no, not no, a question. Because <laughs> I, know, I know that I've got heaps of anger still and heaps mm -hmm. of fears, but at least what I thought I had achieved at least something because I thought that w what I had done was... Mm, Compared to nothing, quite a lot. Well, compared to nothing, it possibly was quite a lot. But there is a long way to go. What a lot of people don't realise is that... If you, how long have you been alive now? 40 plus years. You're not going to tell me exactly. 41. 41, OK. So 41 years you've been alive. Over that period of time, how many thousands of, of emotions do you think you've suppressed? All of them. All of them pretty much, right? The majority of us in the Western world in particular have suppressed the majority of our emotions. And that began from the time that we were just little children. Our parents suppressed them and tried to control them and manipulated them and so forth. 
you've got 41 years of suppressed emotions to feel because they're all within you and the only way they're going to get out of you is by feeling them. Right? Now, 41 years of suppressed emotions, assuming, let's say, we suppressed one emotion a week. Shall we make that assumption? And usually it's a lot more than that that we suppress. But let's say it's one emotion a week. One, so it's 41 by 52 right? emotions. That's over 2,000, yes? Emotions that we're going to have to feel to the depth that we didn't feel them before. Now, you're not going to accomplish that in one week, two week, five week, one year. It's very highly unlikely you will accomplish it in a year, two years, three years. You might accomplish it in 10 or 15 years, perhaps. And in fact, it is possible to accomplish it in 10 years or so, if you really dedicate in addressing the issue emotionally. But you're not going to accomplish it in two weeks in the desert. That's the reality. But many of us want to have... We want to believe that the reality is we should be able to. And then we, what happens is we get angry with God and we get angry with the people who told us that we should deal with our emotions and we get angry with pretty much anyone we can get angry with because we want it to be over. And wanting something to be over is not conducive to helping you deal with things emotionally. So we need to uh, come to accept that we have a unique experience. You have a unique experience. It's only yours. You have 41 years times by how many emotions you suppressed every single week of those years to feel now as a result of what happened. And being angry about it is not going to help you feel them. What's going to help you feel them is, is having a lot more love for yourself than forcing yourself to go out in the desert to deal with an emotion and caring for yourself enough to, to be willing to accept every single one of these emotions emotionally accept every single one of them and accept that every single one of them is either the result of somebody else's actions towards yourself or your choices that were out of harmony with will out of harmony with the loving use of your will and some of those so some of the things have happened to you because of what other people did in other words and some of the things happened because of what you did in terms of the choices you made in your life and all of them are going to have to be felt to the emotional causal level for them to be released. And that is not going to happen in a day or a week or, or, or a month or a year or probably even 10 years for most people who are living on earth. It can happen in a shorter period of time, but it's unlikely for most people because there's so much resistance inside of us. So every time you get angry, you're in resistance. Does that make sense? And that resistance stops you from actually feeling the underlying emotion. Now, you can express the, you, you can go and express the anger and everything, but at some point in the future, you'll come to realize that actually all this anger is because I'm actually addicted to, to avoiding my fear. And it's my fear that I have to feel in the end. And most of us are so like, terrified of feeling fear that we'd rather be angry than feel fear. Because anger is a powerful place. It feels powerful. Right? It makes us feel strong. But fear makes us feel weak. And so we want to avoid fear like, like the plague. We want to avoid it. We want to, that's the last thing we wish to do. And if, if you can understand that through your childhood in particular, but also all through your life, you've had so many fears that you've acted upon, you've now you know, made decisions about them and so forth. And every single one of these things have compounded. And the spirits around you know how much you want to avoid it. And so what they do is they feed you things that, that you accept. Now, in the prayer, you know the Lord's Prayer that's in the Paget Messages, not the one that's in the Bible, but the one that we listed on our website that's in the Paget Messages. In the prayer, there's a section about spirit influence, about avoiding the control and manipulation of spirits. Many of us don't wish to avoid it because we are so focused on wanting pleasure that as soon as we have a moment of pleasure in our life, we go to that thing without considering its long-term ethical stance, what, what's really going on. In other words, we refuse to consider what's really going on. We don't want to know most of the time. 
And so what we do is we take unethical decisions at that point, feeding our joy, describing to ourselves and saying to ourselves, actually, um, I'm doing this because it's bringing me joy and, and you know, that's the right thing to do. When the reality is, if we looked at the ethics involved with many of our choices and decisions, we would find that they are unloving. And this applies to ethics even with yourself. So when you went out in the desert for two weeks, you weren't being loving to yourself. Does that make sense? Because you're being hard on yourself. You're forcing yourself through things that you don't want to address. And, and so, of course, you're not going to get to the real causes. You're only going to deal with superficial issues like that. There are people that I know who have almost a competitive urge when it comes to when they hear divine truth. Isn't that the case, Stalin? Like, they're almost like, I'm going to do this as fast as possible and I'm going to be faster than anybody else and it's going to work great. And those kind of people never get to release anything because none of it's sincere. None of the work they do is sincere. They get overcloaked by spirits as a result and before they know it, all, lots of things happen. Now, for the majority of people who begin this process, this is what actually happens. They start working on emotion that they believe is their own emotion. So this is the start. They believe their own, is their own emotion, but it's actually the emotion of spirits with them who are feeding their addictions. Then they get to a point where they realise that's what's happening. That they have to be far more real than what they thought they were being up until that point. And then they actually do start addressing and reducing the amount of emotions inside of their soul. However, a lot of people at that point have this thing happening. They get angry, resistive, that they have to do it, you know. I don't want to have to do this, this is all bad. And, and then they go through moments where they do do it and release something, but then they get angry again and then, you know, and, and they make choices and decisions in their anger, just as you're making a choice and decision right now to be angry with me, even though you don't realise it. And, and those decisions are harming your, the love that could come out of you. They're harming it, they're, they're affecting it. Whereas if we chose to not do that, and we instead just chose to have this slow release of emotion that is the true causal emotion without having our addictions for pleasure being met, but rather focusing completely on, sincere, on the sincere addressing of particular things rather than forcing ourselves through it, what we would finish up doing is releasing stuff and we'll get to a better place in the end much more rapidly than we do it any other way. So what I would suggest to you is this. Look at why you are wanting to be so hard on yourself. Because you do want to be hard on yourself. And look at why. There's a reason why you want to be hard on yourself. And for, for the majority of people who are hard on themselves, the fear is so big that they want to just push their way through it rather than feel it. In other words, they want to get over it fast rather than just feel it. So my suggestion to you is let yourself look at why you're being hard on yourself and pushing yourself through things and instead allow yourself to feel what the underlying reason is as to why you're hard on yourself. Right? And you'll find that there's fears that need to be released there. And this is basically the process I'm recommending is this. Here's the grief at the bottom. That's what you eventually will feel. Over the top of the grief is the fear. And over the top of the fear are all of your addictions. And when they don't get met, you get angry. All right? That's the general train of emotion. You've seen me draw that many times before, probably, if you've watched some of the videos. Now... Every single time, if you remember this process, you realise that every single time I try to skip over one and go to another, in other words, many of us try to do this, we try to go, I want to get to my grief. And I'm not going to bother about my addictions or my fears, I'm going to get to my grief. And I try to force myself to get to my grief, whatever that grief might be, that I know is present within me, many of us can feel it. What we're doing is we're not releasing the things that keep that grief under control. And so it's going to be a terrible struggle with a lot of pain. 
If the way we do it instead is if we're angry, we feel the addiction that drove the anger. In other words, feel the next layer down. Don't try to go to the end. Feel the next layer down. Feel the addiction. So I go, oh yes, this addiction is that I want people to tell me that everything's going good and I'm going great and that's my addiction. Feel that addiction and feel how off it is. Feel how it creates a lot of things in your life. Feel how it manipulates people in order to give, get you feelings. Feel all of those kind of things. And once you feel it, you won't like it. And then what you'll do is go and say, okay, I want to feel the fear that drives this addiction. And it's the fear that I'm never going to be loved or the fear that I'm useless or worthless or the fear, you know, there's all sorts of fears that may be. And then allow yourself to feel those fears and you'll very rapidly get to the grief. But you are not going to get it by trying to skip over everything. All right? Now when you force yourself, that's what you're doing. You're skipping over the process that God's created for you to release. Remember, this was the layers that were constructed. So the layers have to be deconstructed in the opposite order they were constructed. And for many of us, what we try to do is we skip over the layers we don't like. Now, most men don't like that. So they use all sorts of techniques to skip over that. Grief. Most women don't like that. So they use all sorts of techniques to get over that, or over their fear. And as a result, we can't get to the bottom of everything. And it takes a much longer time. And in fact, for many people, they just give up as a result. Because they feel the pain of not getting through things. And they feel like it's just going on for weeks and then months and then years and then years and years. And, and after a while, they feel despondent and they give up. My suggestion, if you feel like that, is you need to reverse everything and go back to the basics, which is, I'm angry, and that's okay. I'm allowed to feel my anger, but understand that my anger covers my addictions. So there's addictions right now that are not being met that I need to let myself feel about and find out what they are and feel them. Feel how much I want them met. Feel how much I desperately need them. And this is the area where spirits feed us. So a spirit who's unseen person and people on earth feed those P-E-A is not a very good spelling of people. People on earth feed these addictions. Right? And that's how they get their addictions met. By feeding your addictions and you go, oh, you're a wonderful person and then they get their addictions met. Right? It's a codependent addiction fest. Right, that's basically what it is. And what we need to do is see that every time we're fed some things that we think are true and we act upon that in our addiction and the end result is not very happy, we need to see that this is what was the beginning. The beginning of it was that we were unwilling to see the addiction in play. And the event now, now that the event has happened, gives us the ability to see the addiction in play. So I would go back over the life of the, you asked me a question about your life in the last six months and what happened in the last six months. I would go back over my life, if it was me looking at your situation, I'd go back over my life and I'd sit down and I'd write down all the addictions that got met when I was initially told these things that I thought were good. Does that make sense? And I would write every one of them down and I would look at them really seriously about feeling them rather than trying to have somebody come and tell me something and me accept it so readily. There are many people on the planet today that are complete, and in the spirit world, I'm talking about as well, who are completely willing to feed you a heap of bullshit, right? to just a heap of crap, so that they get what they want out of you. That's... In fact, if you think about the world generally, it's pretty much how the world operates, isn't it, almost? And we are so used to accepting it because we want it. That's our problem. And this is where our addictions are so important. So I would suggest to you that this is the area to focus. Not so much on these areas, but this area here. That's the area I would focus on if I was you. And I would look at all the messages that you thought were good that you received over the last six months and 
and I would look at what addictions these particular messages fed, what kind of things that you liked about them, what did you get out of them when you received these particular messages, whether they're from spirits or people on earth, doesn't matter, and let yourself feel about what was driving it inside of yourself. That's what I would do. Yep. If we can, can go back. Uh, mine's more a bit of a bone to pick with God, Jesus. Sorry, bones to what? Bone to pick with God, Jesus. <laughs> um, why did God not allow homosexuals to reproduce? Um, well, the best. So I'll just fix this. What's going on here? Everything looks fine here. It's not true that God didn't allow homosexuals to Okay, why does, why does God not allow me and my girlfriend to produce a child which is a mixture of our genes? Um, when you say, why didn't God allow I can't still see how God didn't allow it. It's just not how you would like it to be allowed. Okay, why doesn't why can, why can, do straight people why are straight people why do straight people have the freedom to create a child that's a mixture of them both, and um, whereas homosexuals aren't afforded that freedom? Well, there's a lot of error in your question. Firstly, a child is not a mixture of the two parents. I knew this was going to come like this way. Uh, a child is not a mixture of the two parents. Okay. A child is a child of God I that know, incarnates yeah. into a body that is the mixture of two parents. Okay. So does the body really matter? Yeah, I knew you were going to come from this angle. So are we, just supposed, to, to. Are we okay, supposed to adopt all the unwanted children? I was, trying, I was trying to come up with my own answer. So I thought maybe... The, Can you feel maybe, your anger in this? Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have anger issues, I admit it. I have anger issues. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I don't know, it just seems a bit unfair. Well, I feel what the big problem is, is our definition of what creates a parent. That's our big problem. All right? and, and this is a big problem societally, but also from God's perspective. You don't own your child. You don't. I know. So yeah. whether this child came from some other procreative process, and nowadays there are a number of different ways <laughs> yes. right, for that to occur, besides a man and a woman getting yeah, together. Yeah. And whether it came from that process or from, uh, from an a, um, adoption or from any other process, you don't own the child anyway. Yeah, I understand not yours. that. And I think I came to realise this a while ago because I was... Um, so can I just point out, though, that if we want the child to be ours, there is already an addiction in yeah, play. I, this is what I came to the conclusion was. Exactly. That I was like, oh, I really want to have a little mini me, you know. Exactly. And so that comes from a place of my ego and all that yeah. kind of thing. Now, those of you who've had children, have you found that they are a mini you? No, they never are. <laughs> that's, that's one of the first things you learn, right? The, the personality profile of the child has been predefined by God through the creative process of the child's soul and it has nothing to do with you whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So there's no reason why we weren't allowed to reproduce, but straight people were. It's just the way it is. Well, it's just the way in terms of, of how your soul incarnated. You incarnated as two females, obviously. And, um, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But I would, the only thing that's affecting your emotions at this point about this issue is your definition of your child and how that is how you're being controlled from not having your child yeah, I see that. and and the reality is that is the problem with all the heterosexual couples having children generally as well they all believe it's their child mm -hmm. and it's got nothing to do with their child they are creating two bodies that cause the incarnation process to occur the only difference is you can't create if you just have a, 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 a uh, non-promiscuous and also, you know, no sperm donor uh, relationship in a lesbian relationship, you don't have that ability to create your own bodies for it just, this. It seems like it's a, a real big gift 
And I feel like we don't have that gift. Is that, is that a way I could put it? Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. However, my feelings are that the gift is really coming to understand that it's not your child. So I could have the gift for an adopted child? Yes. And do you, are there any ethical issues that you would raise with uh, sperm donors and all that kind of thing and how lesbians have children? Or would you just say adopt is the most ethical way to do it? Um, I would say there are certainly huge ethical issues with how we go about procreation today. Um, firstly, any type of storage of cells that have been already fertilised... So let me give an example. So there are, whoops, there are many processes that we can do today, IVF being one of them, where, where fer cells are fertilised and then kept in a fertile state in suspended animation of some kind, frozen in a fertile state. These kind of issues, this kind of uh, process creates huge ethical issues from a soul perspective because the instant the soul has been conceived the body has been conceived, the soul is attached to it. You've now frozen this person who's incarnated from the spirit world in this state and they can't grow, they can't change, they can't until something happens. Now many of these fertilised cells get thrown away, which means that they all get destroyed, which means that a lot of people nowadays who are incarnating from the spirit world can't even live a life on earth other than in a frozen state until they pass into the spirit world, which is not obviously going to feel very good, and it doesn't. So there's that issue. In terms of receiving the sperm and actually just having a sort of an injection of the sperm... Yeah, just going like, straight out in. Yeah, there's no problems with that, is there? In term, one of them might find their way to fertilise the egg, and you could then... And you, that's no ethical issues with that? No, there's no ethical issues with that. In, in any way that I can see, um, particularly if the person donating the sperm is aware of what they're creating uh, in particular, and also um, they, they may wish to do it just out of love, like in terms of love for the person who doesn't have a child. Mm -hmm. um, and they may do that in a loving relationship of their own. Like, so, so no, I don't feel there's too many ethical issues there. There are some ethical issues and then there's other areas where there's not really that many ethical issues from a soul perspective. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would look seriously at the emotion that causes you to want to have your own child. Yeah, I just had a niece recently and I'm getting a lot of joy from looking after her. Mm -hmm. um, so part of me has massively shifted. Well, maybe I can just spend a lot of time with my nieces and my nephews and my girlfriend's nieces and nephews and we can be a really big part in their life and... Maybe I don't need to have my own child. So. Yeah, and I would suggest that once we've even got rid of the definition of my own, yeah. we would actually, you know, you, it have wouldn't even child. come out of your mouth much anymore. Well, the experience of being pregnant and giving birth. Now, I understand how you might want to go through that experience because that would be a very unique experience, but, but half the population doesn't have that experience. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> that's true. And we don't seem to, you know... Too bothered about it. Too bothered about that, so... <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, you know, every man on the planet doesn't have that experience. That's true. Yeah. And, uh, not, not, no, I don't know, but I, I know I don't want one of <laughs> you know, so uh, it's just a thought. But um, the... As, as a woman, you kind of, I don't know, maybe that's, con maybe that's part of our so social conditioning. Again, and there's a lot of injuries in there. What, what defines you as a woman? Is it the ability to give birth? Or is, it, or is it the ability to do you know, a lot of other things, which are the ex feminine expression? It's of one of the gifts we've been given, I would argue, perhaps, that we can be that close to... Yeah, but what's happened on the planet now is many women don't even feel that they're a woman until they give birth. Yeah, that's a problem. This is the reason why we've got girls who are 10 or 8 years of age menstruating, is because there's this emotional pressure on them right from the time they're born or even before to become a woman by giving birth. Like, as if giving birth makes you any more feminine than not giving birth. And, and honestly, it's way out of harmony with love. Uh, and it's also completely um, in disregard of all of God's laws of love, actually, to believe that the only thing that makes you a woman is giving birth. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that, but... Mm. Um 
I can see it as, as, as you said, as an experience that I might want to experience. But it has to come from a place where it's not like, I want to create a little mini me, which is exactly. not Exactly. And it has to come from a place, too, where you don't want to, um, you know, ju just have a... Have a um, experience because of selfish reasons yeah, yeah. Uh, or you know in other words I want to go through the experience of uh, being pregnant and giving birth and um, it's not a very good reason to have a child to be frank because mm. because there's a there's another long process <laughs> after that well, which we'll is be far a lot more richer, important that's for sure yeah and 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 also bear in mind like under your argument half the population should be complaining all the men <laughs> Right, so so this is where I feel you've got to be careful with a lot of our emotional processes. We don't understand a lot of what's driving our emotional processes. Does that make sense? And what's often driving it is a whole set of injuries that we've gotten from society and from our own childhood that then cause us to believe that we have to go through certain experiences in order to be complete. And these particular emotions which drive us frequently, are very often out of harmony with love, completely, and, and, and unfortunately, most of us don't even recognise it at the time. So, so it's very important, I feel, for, for yourself when you're considering these factors, to remember that half the population are in your position, where they can't have a child. Is it then Can we then say God's been unfair to them as well? Right? <laughs> it's a bit arrogant of me to say that. <laughs> exactly. And, and also, Getting told off by Jesus. if you look at all of the uh, underlying um, emotional reasons why you wish to have a child, in comparison which you call of your own, rather than just have a child that you can love and care for, yeah. there are often quite large emotional injuries involved in that that's worth looking at and yeah. working through. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'd like some clarity on something. I'm trying to... OK, I've got a question about the environment and whether certain environments are conducive and beneficial to well-being yep. and other environments not so. Yep. Um, what I'm trying to get clarity on is whether I'm overlooking something, whether I have some blind spots. And for example, mm -hmm. I'm becoming more and more sensitive and I travel a lot mm -hmm. and I find that when I'm here, mm -hmm. In, in England and London, yep. uh, I get affected really quickly. Yep. Uh, my mood goes down, I become disconnected, yep. I find it hard to tune in. Yep. Um, I'm trying to distinguish whether it's I'm back in a place that I'm familiar with and so therefore it's influence on me. Mm -hmm over my whole life, mm -hmm. uh, I find that as soon as I step out, my mood changes. Mm -hmm. Or whether I'm just overlooking something here and no, I'm blaming uh, my environment. Let's look at it from a, from a truthful perspective. Okay, really. please. So here's your soul. Your one, your one half of the soul. So here's your soul, feminine, connected with the two bodies. Um, your body might not look exactly like that, but that's <laughs> as good as we go. Now, um, so there, there's you. That's you as a sum title. Now, you carry around with you every unhealed emotion. So let's just call them, should we call them unhealed? Or it might be just as easy to call them unfelt emotions. Does that make sense? Now, the environment in which you grew up from a very young child is the environment that created these emotions. So if we look at the sum total of these unhealed emotions, we can see that it's the childhood environment that created them. So when you are in your childhood environment, that is the place that is going to access and push all of your buttons more than any other place right? now if if you you find it's a country it will be a country it will be actually sometimes even a location in the country it depends on how attached you are to that childhood environment as to where it will be but for the majority of people it's a country and a place in that country that just makes them feel a certain way 
And, and so what the majority of people do is instead of feeling the emotions that cause their despondent feelings, they choose to travel to another country. And then that country has a different set of childhood environment emotions that it would have created. And because it's not the same set of emotions that are in you, you get to avoid all of your emotions from your childhood. Sure, that would make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, there's a second part to your question. Mm. There is, of course, environments, physical environments, that will help us access things emotionally. Right, exactly, yeah. And, and these physical environments, obviously, are more connected with nature and more connected with, you know, the uh, pure way of eating and drinking and sleeping and being in tune with the environment around you. However, for the majority of people who are wanting to address emotions, the fastest way to access them is to return to your childhood environment. <laughs> and actually, I keep returning here yeah. and wondering why I keep returning here. And I know that actually things are speeding up and I'm here to do the work because I go straight into it when I return. Exactly. Um, that sounds very clear mm -hmm. to me. I also hear myself saying, though, that uh, I'm using a lot of energy keeping that out. You are. Yep. And that being, I've always felt it as um, the energetics of the environment, maybe influence of... Well, the environment the is opposing you. You're opposing your environment. Whenever you come here, you're opposing your environment the most, <laughs> in fact. That's why there is a lower amount of energy, a lower amount of joy, because you're opposing your environment the most. You're preventing your own emotions, and in, and in doing so, opposing your environment. And it's not a very good way to access mm. causal emotion and release these mm. unfelt emotions. Mm. But it's way the majority of people choose. Okay. You know, they, there is an opposition that we place mm. between ourselves and the environment to prevent ourselves mm. from experiencing the emotions that the environment is projecting upon us. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing with that um, is that we end up holding on and even resisting more the emotions when we could have the opportunity to release them. So my suggestion, instead of doing that, is to look at your fears associated with the childhood environment and emotions because it's always these fears that cause you to run away to run away from their their being triggered and you'd say it was a running away rather than a just a preference of knowing that another environment's okay all right <laughs> i get it you don't want it to be but yes <laughs> yes it is right. damn <laughs> now this does not mean that in the future you may not have some preferences that are mm. different than your current preferences, but they won't be driven by any fear to avoid childhood emotions. And in fact, what will happen is you will be able to be in any location of oh. the world without feeling oppressed emotionally by the location. Mm. So when you're at one with God, that's the pure condition. The pure condition is you're not oppressed by any location. Mm. You finish up having a preference because you like, might like the nature more than you like a city, or you might like a city more than you like nature, or whatever it is. Well, actually, interestingly enough, I've just been to a location which is a very oppressed and unliberated environment where I felt much better than here. Interesting, hey? Yeah. You know why that's the case? Well, because here... Two oh, reasons. On. Far away, what do you think there? Well, I thought uh, just exactly what you said is... Well, that's one? Yeah. And what's the next one? The oppression there, childhood oppression there, is worse than the childhood oppression that you experienced. Mm. And so you find it easy to live there because it, 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 like it's, a, it's not the same direction uh -huh. as the oppression you experienced. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it makes you then feel like, oh, my life's pretty good yeah. like, compared to... I actually said when I was there, again, I heard myself saying, I can really feel my own shape in this environment. And I looked at the environment and how oppressed and unliberated it was. Yes. But I could clearly feel my own shape. Okay. Because actually it's that's... Because in this environment, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. You see, when, you, when you've heal, healed these, or felt these emotions, um, you get to a point where no matter <laughs> what environment you're in, you feel good. Okay. And your feelings of feeling good are immaterial, like what's happening around you has, n has no effect on how you feel. Okay. 
right? And you don't then feel attracted to one place over another. You go to places based on desire. Yeah. So, so in other words, and your desires are not going to be based on location. Because remember, at some point in your future, you're going to die and not even be on the earth. And then how are you going to get to Spain? Like, <laughs> like you'll have to, you know what I mean? Like, how are you going to lounge on the beach in Spain? Well, <laughs> you, there's probably lots of places in the spirit world where you can lounge on the beach, and there is. But... Um, my suggestion to you is that we often have addictions to environments on earth that are based around what these environments allow us to express and what these environments allow us to oppress without feeling internally oppressed. Like, so, mm. so this is the, the situation we face. Once you are a spirit, what would you like to do? You, at this point in time, many of us have lives that are completely focused around the physical. In other words, our... We, we choose where we live and what we work at and all those other things completely on physical issues. We don't feel our desires, really. And once you truly connect with a desire, you will realise that this desire will go and extend not only through your life on earth, but also all the way through your life in the spirit world. And that's the indication of whether the desire is pure or not. When the desires are pure... They are independent of location. Does that make sense? Yeah. Independent of location. When your desires are not pure, they will be focused on location. Mm -hmm. In other words, you think you can only meet your desires when you go there. Uh -huh. Or you only meet your desires when you go here. Yeah. And if that's the case, then it's all based on what unfelt emotions you're attempting to avoid. That makes complete sense. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. It's good. Just straight behind would be good. And then um, where are we with the mic yeah. here? Yeah. Oh, if we come across to yeah. Chris, is it? Far away? Uh, AJ, I have a question for you. Um, my life has been full of darkness till I was 35 years old. And uh, I've been for three years in a mental hospital for looking for help. Uh, what did change my life is doing my first uh, time uh, uh, prayer ever to God. So I did, was a non-believer. I didn't believe in anything. And after yeah. the prayer, my life started to change. Yeah. What happened to me is uh, I received my first healing ever in Antwerp, and I had, I would call it a memory of Glastonbury Tor, Tor rising up in front of my eyes. And of, sorry, what? Glastonbury uh, Tor, sorry. That's Tor. Tor. Yeah, my English. Tor. Tor, yes. Ah, okay. Rising up in front of my eyes, yeah. and three months after the experience, I was reading a spiritual magazine, and again I saw that Tor, Tor, uh, in that magazine, yeah. and I had such a feeling coming out of my belly, yeah. so I jumped out of the bus a week later, and I came to Glastonbury. Yeah. So my feeling is that God guided me to come to Glastonbury in order to heal myself, which also uh, happened for me so far, because it allowed me to heal myself. Can so I suggest there's a number of things going on for you? Yes. And Sorry. sometimes <laughs> we've got to be careful that we don't mix up what God's doing with what other people are doing. Oh, okay. okay. And your initial prayer to God, so you initially prayed sincerely to God, and that brought a response from God, right? But what happened with Thor is completely different, leading you to Gladstonebury. How do you spell it? Um, Glastonbury Tor is a famous sort of hill in Glastonbury. That's, uh, that's what he saw. He saw the yeah. hill saw in Glastonbury. So, he, yeah, he... He got guided to a place. And he a got guided. Who yeah. by? Well, sorry. See, you're assuming it's by God. Yes, um, I, saw, I had a healing, and I saw that thing yes. rising up in front of my eyes within the healing. Yeah, and yeah, and it wasn't God. Sorry, it wasn't God. Uh, from out of my perspective, it was. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but I'm, me saying, the, yeah. I'm saying it wasn't. Yeah. It was Thor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Thor's not God. Yeah. Now, why did Thor lead you to Glastonbury? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> what happens in Glastonbury? What happened in Glastonbury is I, I get pretty much confronted with myself. Yeah. That, so in order to that, yeah, it allowed me to heal myself for the first time ever, yeah, actually. So, so this is good. This is good, yes. Yes, yes, that's good. But what else happens at Glastonbury? <laughs> a, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff? If we can we be specific. Um, a lot of in, inauthenticity and, and new age and, and right. There's a strong the new thing. age mm. movement there, is there yeah. not? Yeah. Okay. 
So this is an illustration of how sort of God works with what, you, what God's got. <laughs> and when I say what God's got, what we have within ourselves is what God's got to work with. So, so in your case, you prayed and God obviously responded to your prayer. But in this process also, you've, the reason why you've been in psychiatric institutions in the past is because you've had an overcloaking by spirits many of those times where you've become psychotic in behaviour. Right? Now these particular psychoses result from the abdication of your life and giving yourself away to spirits. And this is something that you've done many times in your life in the past without necessarily recognising it. Now in this process... There are a lot, quite a number of spirits around you constantly trying to influence your life. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what they're going through with you now is a bit of a, a blackmail bribery process um, in, the, in the sense that they don't like the direction you're taking and they're trying to make your life quite difficult. That's what they're trying to do now. Whereas before, they liked the fact that you wanted to get out of your body and, and let them tell you what to do and guide what you do. They like that. That's what they want you to do. Now this spirit, he, he's, he wants you to do better than that. So he, he's, got some of your, he's got some of your best interests at heart. But he is not God. Right? And he is not going to necessarily lead you to where you want to go in the long run. He's just, God is just help, helping you through this process of recognising that there are some spirits that have got your best interests at heart. And there are some spirits that don't have your best interests at heart at all. And many of the spirits you've connected with in the past did not have your best interests at heart. And this is why you ended up in psychiatric institutions in the past. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. Yep. And, and this spirit, he has a bit more of your best interests at heart. He, he's a bit more you know, loving towards you. However, it doesn't mean that he's God and he's always going to retain a loving interest towards you. It depends on what you do. Right? And my suggestion is the experience you had is an experience given by feelings from spirits which you are very open to receiving. And this is relating to your previous question in our previous session. And what you need to do is look at why you are so open to receiving these things from spirits. Now, once you work through these things that you're open to receiving, you will find that some of the spirits have been manoeuvring you in certain directions which have been very um, catastrophic for your life and then other spirits such as this one will move your life in a direction which is much more nice, nice for your life, nicer for your life. However, it doesn't mean that they're moving you in the direction of God. So understand that a God is going to just work with what God has at the time. And if you are easily influenced by spirits, then God is going to al allow spirits, of course, which, which you're, basically it's your soul that allows it, allows certain spirits. And because you prayed, he's now allowing a certain spirit who's in a much better condition right, to influence your life than a person who was in a much worse condition before. Right? And it does not mean that this person even is going to have a long-term influence over your life. That is going to be completely dependent upon your will to continue growing towards God. My suggestion is continue praying with God, pray, pray towards God, not expecting automatic changes or, or fantastic revelations so much as it is. This is where I drive myself crazy. If I don't get an answer within two days, then they're, they're just playing games with me and then I go all the way back. Yes. It's a constant struggle within myself, to be honest. What God's trying to show you through this process is how much you're willing to give up your will and be guided by spirits all of your life. And it is a major problem that you've faced ever since you were a young man. And my suggestion is to look at what emotions cause you to give up your will. What we're finding, we're meeting more and more people, particularly young men, who are giving up their will at, in, during their teenage years and, and becoming almost totally overcloaked. We had three young fellows just visit us two or three weeks ago at our home. They rocked up at our home uninvited and they, and they said, oh, we're from Andromeda. And we said, no, you're not. You're from Earth. <laughs> right? And then they got very angry. Right? But, but that, that illustrates how like, 
how invested they are in giving up their will and becoming overcoat by spirits who want them to believe certain things. And the spirits with them were just intense as wanting them and controlling the majority of their life, actually. Controlling everything they talk about, controlling everything they did. They were meeting up with other people who thought they were from Andromeda <laughs> as well. And there's this whole clan of spirits guiding all of these meetings and everything. Their entire life has been given up. And the reason why is these young men have felt no power in their personal life and are seeking power now. They want power. They want to know everything about others. They want to know what others are thinking and on all this. And these spirits tell them all that information. And we've got to examine very carefully why we want this kind of interaction with spirits. And now, what's happening is your spirit friend and God is trying to help you examine that now. And this is partially why your life is for the first time starting to improve is because you also now have a willingness yeah. to examine. But, but examine the addictions that were present right back in your young adulthood that have guided much of the events that have happened, the painful events that have happened through your life. Yeah. Yeah. I have, uh, thank you for making um, for, sense. Uh, I have, ever since I was a kid, also my partner, I have done her, we have a strong sense of purpose and we want to live our life in service. And what I want to do is, a bit like you, uh, guiding younger people and how, in order to find themselves. But I have the right to do this now because I still don't feel like I'm controlling myself yet. So uh, I have to be honest, within two months I want to start with, with my first uh, uh, seminar in Belgium. I have a couple of friends up there who are willing to listen, but... I'm kind of questioning myself, am I ready? Am I, 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 do I have the right to do this? Because I don't always, really mastering myself. <laughs> yeah, always engage your desires, but understand that the results will be definitely de guided by what errors you have inside of you emotionally. So engage your desires and then let God feed back to you what's going on. Now, now just take a lot of care because you're going to attract a lot of very spirit-influenced people because of the history that you've had with spirit influence. And so be aware of that. Understand what's going on for you with that first. And then as you understand that, you'll be able to help others go through the same thing. Can I also, though, point out that this feeling in you that you have a purpose and this desire to have a purpose... Um, what I notice a lot of people doing, and particularly, again, a lot of these young men come to us and they, and they say, oh, I've got a purpose, I just haven't discovered what it is yet, but I know I've got a purpose. And I'm going, yeah, you've got an addiction to, to being special. So, and one reason why people get overcloaked by spirits a lot is because they want to be special and unique and they feel inside of themselves that they're not special and unique without some external help without somebody who knows everything, overcloaking them and showing them what they know. And so what we, f what we often observe is there is this willingness in people who believe they have a purpose to get overcloaked by spirits. And I've known some people to actually get overcloaked and be overcloaked for the rest of their life by that spirit. And really all they're doing is what the spirit tells them for the rest of their life. I suggest to you that's not God's purpose for you to do that. So what you want to do is find what your own personality is. To do that, you're going to have to separate your personality from the personalities of the spirits that are influencing you. And to do that, you've got to look at your addictions first. So always focus on the addictions, what, what you're wanting. In the end, you will do something with a desire no matter who listens. See, when you have a pure desire, it does not matter to you who hears it. You just engage your pure desire. That's all you do. Now, I've got a friend in, a, in, in Australia who uh, you may have seen in some of the, uh, or maybe one of the um, interviews. His name is Fabio. He plays the guitar. He doesn't care who hears him play the guitar. I have seen him go out in the middle of a field and just play the guitar and sing. Right? He does not have any expectation that anyone else engages his passion or desire or 
even agrees with it or gives him accolades or approval for it. He has no expectation of any of those things. As a result of that, his life has greatly changed over the last two or three years that I've known him. He was a painter and now he earns money only from his music. He used to paint for around 40 to 50 hours a week or more. Uh, I mean house painting, that's what he used to do. And, and he had his own band, which he would do on the side, you know. And then as soon as he started addressing some of these issues and having a pure desire, which just focused on his desire, what he fi finished up happening now, this is like, so three years later from when we first met him, he, he, um, he works about eight to ten hours a week and earns the same amount of money from music, eight to ten hours a week, as what he earned from painting 40 to 50 hours a week. All right? And the reason why that happens is because when people go along to listen to him, they can feel that he doesn't have any demands of them. He doesn't have any you know, desire that everyone listens and everyone listens to his songs. He's always just trying to perfect his desire. And as a result of perfection, perfecting his desire, people want to come and people want to pay him. And people want to... And he, he does it by donation. He gets paid by donation and earns more by donation doing his music than he used to earn asking an a hourly rate when he was painting. And, and that is an indication of a person who is just engaged in their desire without the need for everyone else to share in their desire. So I would suggest too that that's what's going to happen with each of us when we truly engage our desires. When we truly engage our desires, we'll come to terms with the fact that no one else needs to be present while we have our desires. So any desire that needs someone else present in order to be satisfied is possibly driven by more addictions than by a desire. Does that make sense? So yeah, it scares yeah. me a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right? But, but the reality is, it's a beautiful thing. Because what it means is, you can engage your passion and desire in isolation and eventually you won't be in isolation because there'll be just all these people attracted to you wanting to share, feel the results of your passion and desire. This is what happened to me in my first century life. People didn't listen to me by the thousands because of me trying to force myself upon them. They listened to me because I engaged my personal desire. My personal desire is relationship with God, knowing everything about the universe and the way God's laws work with God, like wanting to know from God how all of these things work. That's my passion and desire. I don't have a desire necessarily to go around teaching it or all those other things. That's not a strong part of my desire. My desire is to focus on this relationship with God. As a result of that, my own happiness grew, my own enjoyment grew, and people wanted me to share the truth with them. And of course, because my passion and desire is discovering all these truths and, and therefore I'm perfectly happy to share them. Just like Fab's passion and desire is to play music and he's perfectly happy to share it if, if somebody wants to hear it. Um, but we do not need the other person to do that. I feel the side of this too. I mm. feel it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yep. um, oh, right, sorry. Can I go over to here? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Oh, sorry, no, we're here with Chris first and then we'll go over. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I wanted to pick up on what that lady was saying earlier. With the environment? Uh, yes, and yep. how it, well, facing it in some way. I go from A to B and I walk along a road which is about a mile long. And this road is very problematic for me personally because um, it, when cyclists on the odd occasion ride on a pavement, it really pisses me off. Mm -hmm. And also there are a number of occasions when cars drive on the pavement just to park half on the pavement, half on the road. And this is a road that doesn't have any yellow lines on. Um, and this happens regularly, and I get pissed off by it, seriously. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking, and on a couple of occasions last week, the timing of these two cars that were mounting the pavement was such that they mounted the pavement right next Near to me. Near you. Yes. Mm. So that obviously triggered me even more. And I'm that. thinking, yeah. well, quite. Oh, totally. And I know it at the time. That's good. Um, so you're observing yourself feeling angry. You can feel the anger coming up. I get you. caught out by the anger and yep. then say one minute later, I'm you able realize. to catch myself. Yep. No, that's good. That's good. Now, I'm thinking that why on earth would I want to... Con I can take another route to, from A to B. 
why on earth would I want to continue using this road, yep. which I know just that stretch of road is where these happen, because the other stretches of road that I use, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Why would I want to continue using this stretch of road to be triggered in my anger when I could take another route which wouldn't trigger me? So where why did, what does your anger make you feel? Uh, I can't connect to this thing underneath. It's just red hot rage. Yeah, but, but it makes you feel some things even as you're describing it. Oh, it, I have an addiction. I like it. It's, you like I came it? to a yes. realization where I, I really Can we be wanted. more specific of what do you like about it? Um, uh, I might like the abuse that happens to me. Why would you like abuse happening to you? I don't know. It's yeah, just you do. I've just realized you, it. Yeah, you why, do. why do I like the abuse? Why, yeah, why do we like abuse? Well, there's a few reasons, but not. Uh, I'm going to phone, uh, go in, hone in on the one that he's feeling, right? <laughs> Some others will be different. Why do I like being abused? Yeah. There's a feeling that comes up in you when well, you're abused. Well, self-loathing. No. No. Isn't there a feeling of injustice that comes oh, up inside? Oh, totally, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so when you're abused... Just mention them and I'll say yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> so there's a feeling of injustice that comes up in you. Yes. And what does that make you feel? Uh, we go down the train. It makes you feel superior. Oh, I have that, yes. Right? In other yes. words, it makes you feel like, yeah, there's another stupid person doing another stupid... Yes, stu yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's another stupid person doing another stupid thing. <sighs> Arrogant, superior, all those, yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so it makes you feel like you can judge them and get away with it? Uh, yes, I'm highly judgmental in that situation. Yeah, yeah, so yes. you can judge them and get away with it, that's good. Judge them. Oh, that I'm, that I'm right and righteous. Ah, yes, it yes. makes you feel right. Yes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's what you like about it. The anger gives you these things, right? Okay, yes, okay. yes. There's your addictions. Your addictions are you want to feel injustice because okay. when you feel injustice, you get to feel superior and you get to feel like you can be judged and you get to feel like you're right and they're wrong. And that means that underneath all of that, so that's your addictions, it means underneath all of that, is your fears that you're not superior. In fact, you're inferior. Oh. And that you're judged constantly by others and that you're often wrong. And you don't want to feel those things. I don't want to feel that I'm wrong or judged by well, others. Those are the things you fear. Otherwise, you wouldn't create those addictions. So you ask the question, why do I walk down that road? It's because you get to feel all of those things when you walk down that road. Exactly. And that now when I you walk down the other road, you don't get to feel. Yes. That's why you walk down the road. But I now no longer want to walk down that road and walk down the one where it doesn't happen. Well, I suggest... Because then I feel I'm treating myself with such disrespect for continuing to go through these feelings in walking down this particular road. Why would I want to be so disrespectful towards myself? Because you want those feelings. But now why do I want to feel when I have the choice to consciously choose another route? Well, you, want to, you still have these feelings of wanting these feelings in you. And until you actually okay. feel all the reasons why you're still going to be okay. drawn to walking down the road that allows you to feel all those feelings. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So, I, so basically, if I'm going to face those, I'm going to have to continue walking down that particular road. Well, walk down the road, and instead of feeling the anger of it, feel the injustice and go, what, you know, what's in my childhood is really being... I can't get past the anger. I can't feel the stuff that's underneath it. That's my yeah, problem. So when we can't get past the anger, it's because our anger feeds our addictions. If, we can't, if we're not getting past anger, it's not real anger. It's, it's addictions that are not being met. So in other words, when you walk down that road, you get to feel right. You get to be judged. You get to feel mm. superior. Right? You get those things up. So, of course, you're going to walk down the road, right? Until you realize that these are all addictions covering over deeper emotions where you don't feel superior and that you need to feel the pain of that. And you don't feel like you're right a lot of the times. A lot of times you feel wrong. And in fact, in your childhood, if you think about your childhood, you were made to feel wrong many times, even when you were right. All right?
How did your dad make you feel? Uh, it's like he killed me, basically. How? Because he was and is totally incapable of expressing emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, he w- did and continues to fly into rages mm-hmm. on a hair trigger, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, he never and still doesn't outwardly uh, show his love towards me. Mm-hmm. I um, agree. And in fact, I've, for the last couple of years, I'm the one that's, through what I've gone through, who's been able to move towards him to start hugging him and yep. things like that. Um, but it's, it's been complete. I mean, it's like a, a walking brain. He's a walking brain with no connection. Yep. And I, you know, so the rage that, that, that came through and the emotional disconnection and the lack of any kind of demonstrative love, not physically, but, mm. you know, vibe Emotionally, yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and he, he's always felt superior to you. He's always right, you're always wrong. Okay, okay. These are things that you will feel as you work your way through your relationship. But a lot of these things are actually related to your dad in terms of how your dad made you feel about yourself and how your dad made you feel in terms of whether you... Kind of mm. in terms of your environment and justice and all, all these kind of things. You feel very... Like there's a great emotion that rises in when you th- consider your father of huge amount of injustice in your relationship okay. with him. Right. Yep. And these particular things cause you to want to... Instead of feeling the, the, the sadness that's in yourself about those things, you want to overcome your sadness and your fears by creating these addictions... And this road is one of the ways you do it. Sorry? This road is one of the ways you do it, walking down this road. Hmm. Like I said, many of our day-to-day, minute-by-minute actions are totally driven Mm. by our avoidance of certain emotions. We were driving in the car, Peter and Angela driving in the car, and they then asked me some questions afterwards and said, um, you know, if there's any feedback you want to give us, we'd be happy to receive it. And I said, no worries. Um, okay, let's start. Like, <laughs> um, and we went shopping together, didn't we? We went shopping together as well. And I just listed five or ten of their addictions that I observed in a space of one minute. And actions that they took as a result of those particular addictions in the space of that minute, if they were aware, they would have seen differently. And that is the case for the majority of people. The majority of people do not realise that even their moment-by-moment choice and decisions are driven only by specific emotions they're trying to suppress or get. So you, this is the thing with addictions. We're trying to suppress certain emotions while at the same time get others. And, uh, and most of our actions are taken. And so, like, we, if I give it, you don't mind me giving the illustration of driving along. So Pete's driving along the car with us in the car. He's a little bit nervous that we're in his car. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. But at the time, when you picked us up from the airport, it was a bit nervous. And, uh, and, so, and then with Peter, he's a very sensitive man. So he's very sensitive to the emotions of every single person around him. And so what happens was, as he was driving along, if there was a projection from any car driver around him, he could feel it, and he would automatically respond with his foot on the accelerator. So it would be off the accelerator, on the accelerator, slight turn here, slight turn there, slight movement away from that person. <laughs> that lorry driver is pretty angry, got to get away from him. And he didn't realise that almost every choice he was making on the road was being driven by the avoidance of a fear of some emotion coming from those particular drivers. Does that make sense? Mm. And, and this is something that we're frequently unaware of with regard to most of our life. We're, we're not aware of how much of our life is invested in denying uh, or suppressing the real deeper emotions that drive us. Now, now, once Peter became a bit more conscious of that, he started to realise like every time that he feels the need to put a foot on the accelerator, that means he wants to get away from the person behind him. <laughs> you know, and every time he feels the need to put it off, that means the person in front. And every time he just swerves a bit to the side, that means it's the person. There's a feeling coming from the person at that side. And if you can allow yourself to feel it, you can work out a lot about yourself. 
you can work out what emotions you're denying, what emotions you're suppressing, what, what you need to work your way through. So you're suggesting that I, I try and connect with my feeling of injustice and superiority and every time that particular situation happens? Yep. You, every time, every time, you want to create injustice to prove to yourself that you know better than they do <laughs> in that moment, right? And this is the, the feeling that it gives you of superiority. Mm -hmm. So this is where you prefer to dr go along a road that makes you feel like everything's unjust because it then gives you this feeling of strength that is not able to be felt when you go on the other road. Yeah. But then I'm not facing the sense of injustice when I'm walking down that road. You're not. You're, what you're doing is you're going into anger and the anger makes you feel strong and okay, right, right, superior right, right. and yes. makes, you feel, makes you feel justified yes. and makes you feel like, you know, they're the one that's wrong. I'm right. Yeah. You, but how, how, if I'm so still caught out by the anger, how can I access the sense of righteousness or injustice if I'm well, so caught out by the anger? Well, you're caught up by, by the anger because you do not want to feel the opposite. And this is what you need to pray about. So what you, what you have underneath these addictions is the fears that you need to come to terms with. The fear that you're not right. The fear that you're not superior. Okay. In fact, the fear that you're like your dad tells you, that you're inferior, not right, always wrong. You know, these are the feelings that, you know, the feeling that, uh, you know, you want to be angry with your dad, really. Yes. And while you want to be angry with your dad, you're going to create that. And until you get to the point where you just want to grieve what your dad has done, you will continue to want to create that. Does that make sense? Mm. Mm. Up the back there. Thanks. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> um, yeah, my question is about... Um, I'm feeling all the time lots of, if I'm feeling all the time a lot of negative things uh, like fear and loneliness and neediness and all these things which I'm feeling a lot, mm -hmm. um, why am I not, <laughs> if I'm feeling them, why am I not um, processing them? Yes, there's a big difference between processing them and experiencing them properly, isn't there, and feeling them. Yeah. Right. Yep. It's always pretty much the same answer, you know. We've got these layers <laughs> and uh, what you've got to do is look at what you get out of uh, it. We see this with most of our addictions, because what we've been talking about here are addictions. Um, and our addictions cover our fears and they cover our grief, right? So, so we, know, we know that that's the general theory, if you like. And then, of course, we revert to anger whenever they're not met. And if we want to suppress anger, we'll even go further and we'll cause ourselves depression. Where we suppress everything. Go into total denial of every emotion possible. Is that, what's happen is that what's happening to me? <laughs> well, no, what's happening... Because I feel de quite depressed. You feel quite depressed, yeah, <laughs> you do. And yes, uh, what you're doing is you're trying to selectively process through emotions that you've, uh, whoops, that you've identified within yourself but not yet developed a willingness to feel. And then, because you haven't got a willingness to feel it, you get quite down on yourself, right, and negative and then start blaming yourself and then that doesn't feel good either so then you suppress those feelings and eventually what you get out of that is depression right or a general detunement from everything that's going on around now of course the only way to change this is to go back down the way it was created so so when we're at a state of depression the only way to get out of that is to start feeling how angry we are in a sense. Now, unfortunately, in today's society, that's not very much accepted that you need to go into that direction, right? And so this tells you that probably one of the addictions is probably 
wanting to get society's approval or general approval uh, rather than feel or express what you really feel with your anger. And I suppose the difficulty in living in close, close quarters, um, which I feel is something you live close by other people, like in the same house with other people. Where, where, how do you live at the moment? Um, I live with my mother and my uh, son, a uh, 17 months old son. Yeah, who, who created most of your emotional injuries? Maybe my mother. Yeah. <laughs> and you're living with the very person who's created most of your emotional injuries. And if I get angry, she... she <laughs> yes. She does the same thing she's always done. She just makes me feel like I'm an awful person. Exactly. Exactly. The problem with living with the persons who created your emotional injuries is that they are going to continue to attempt to suppress your ability to deal with them. Yeah. Now, you're living with her for financial reasons? Yeah. <laughs> so you're making a compromise financially I, of yourself. I only your did it when my partner left because I, I needed some... Because I've got a young son and I couldn't work anymore. I understand the process. <laughs> I understand what's going on. Um, my suggestion is to look at your willingness to compromise your own emotional well-being for the sake of... Uh, financial reasons. Yeah. Now, your mother has suppressed these kind of emotions inside of you all of your life. Anger. You, yeah. If I get angri angry, she, she, she just shuts me down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She wants to suppress your anger. Like I said, all of your life she's been doing this. If you live with her, it's highly unlikely you'll actually get through the emotion. Okay. And the reason why is because she is the person who created the suppression of the emotion in the first place. So it's highly unlikely she's going to let you deal with it now when she's been using all of her effort to suppress it in you for all of your life. The only way in which you're going to be feel free to address these particular emotions is by being outside of her control, outside of her will. But when you live in somebody's house... You have yeah. to concede to their will. That's yeah. the price you pay. Right? So, uh, and also know. I live there because I'm afraid of being lonely as well. You, yes, you've got other reasons why you live there. But the, to, frankly, it's far better to be lonely <laughs> than it is to live with a person who suppressed you for all of your life and continuing to suppress you. Yeah. Like I'd, I personally would much rather feel lonely than, than live with constant suppression. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, though, that you're afraid of loneliness more than you're afraid of constant suppression. <laughs> right? And yeah. so you make the compromise. And you're afraid of uh, financial insecurity more than you're afraid of living in a... Uh, uh, of suppression, the actual suppressive environment that you're mm. living in. And as a result, you're making a choice. It's a free will choice you're making to live in an oppressive environment that suppresses your emotion. And the only way that you can live in that environment is by completely suppressing everything that you feel. And then, of course, you're going to get depression. Yeah. You see? So, if you were living in harmony with choices that were about love of you, love of yourself, you would, you would have to, at some point either be able to express your emotion in your current environment, which is highly unlikely given the fact that it's not your environment, it's your mother's. <laughs> and, and also you would have to at some point, probably as a result of that, leave your current environment and live somewhere else. But your other fears are affecting your decision to do such a thing. You know the environment you're living in is not conducive to your emotional well-being but you're willing to pay the price of your own emotional well-being for other reasons. Yeah. Does that make sense? And I would recommend to you that you stop doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because if you continue doing that, you're going to find the complete suppression of your emotion will result in some major depression. And, uh, and then, of course, doctors will want to put you on medication and all those kind of things. This is not going to be good for you or your child. And uh, it's also not good for your child to grow up in a, 
environment in a house where you have already felt suppressed because yeah. your child is also going to feel suppressed. Yeah. So I feel you need to make some decisions. Okay. And, <laughs> and can I point out a few things about decisions? I'm very when, bad at that. <laughs> when we make decisions that are harmonious with love, mm -hmm. right? So if we make so we're faced with decisions and our decisions are harmonious with love and truth. Uh -huh. All of God's laws work for us in that place. Okay. So you can find a location where you can afford to live. You can find a job which will suit exactly what you need for bringing up your child. All of these things are possible, right? But only if you live in harmony with love and truth. Live in harmony with love of yourself, love of your neighbour, love of truth. And these things will be found. But you don't have any faith in that at the moment. You don't believe that yet. Right? And this is why you're willing to compromise. So I would pray to God about getting some faith. So what you need is some faith. That if you live in harmony with love and truth, everything will be better than what it currently is. And you'll be able to attract a location where you can live safely and with some security without having to have your mother in your life every day suppressing your emotions. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Most of us lack this faith. We, we don't believe God's got our best interests at heart, right? And that God can organise the universe for us in any way. But that's not true. God, God built the whole universe. Of course, it's all organised by God. But that's all organised based on principles of love and truth. So we have to bring ourselves into harmony with love in order for the change to occur. While you're willing to sacrifice the love of yourself, you are not in harmony with how God views you. God loves you and does not want you to sacrifice love of yourself. Does that make sense? So God wants you to honour yourself and to stop putting up with mum's crap right, and mum's suppression and all that stuff that's going on with mum. Does that make sense? And yeah. to love yourself. That's what she wants. Now mum needs to deal with her stuff, right? That's up to her. She has free will. She's allowed to do whatever she wants. But because you live in her house, you now have to do what she wants. If, you, if you're not in a house, now you can do what you want to a larger degree, which is the use of your will. And that's what you need if you're ever going to face these emotions. Yeah. Okay, thank that, you very much. Is that clear enough? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Let's go across. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, this is a, a bit of a tough one, uh, really. I've been basically um, diagnosed with a uterine neoma, so like a, a benign tumor. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, two years ago, more or less about the same time that I encountered you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been doing a lot of emotional healing. Uh, I actually stopped working, which was a very stressful job, which I was uh, giving a lot to a lot of people and not really to myself. Uh, and uh, well... Wh can I ask where the tumor was again? Uh, in my uterus, uterus so second yeah. chakra. Okay. Um, yeah, and at the moment, this is a curious thing that's been happening where I get a lot of spasms in my neck, and it, it, it sort of feels like uh, energy is being uh, uh, like released upwards. Like now, uh, you guys were talking about uh, lots of things that were triggering me, and I could definitely yeah. feel my neck like spasm, felt like a release of energy. Yeah. I'm just wondering if this is. Uh, if you just hold that mic sorry. up a bit, then. <laughs> I'm wondering if this is. Um, I. If it's something that's actually happening, is it uh, energy being released or and healed, or is the spirits um, basically playing with my head? Well, what's happening, I feel for yourself, is mm. that um, every time you hear me talk about mothers, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you have this uh, <laughs> feeling come up in you, right? Mm -hmm. And and basically, when I was talking, what was your name? Catherine. Catherine. When I was talking to Catherine, and mm. um, the there was feelings of acknowledgement coming up in you about how you've been treated by your mother. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, whenever we have these feelings of acknowledgement, 
there is a release of some energy. I suggest to you, though, that it's not a huge amount of energy mm. because there is a lot of things for you to process about mother, right? Mm. Now, can I put out to most of us, most, for most of us, a lot of our injuries are related to our mothers mm. for, for very uh, logical reasons, actually. One reason is that many of our mothers spend a lot more time with us than our fathers. Yeah. And as a result of that, whatever emotional injury do have an effect. If we just take down that mic, it's that one there, it's causing that. Um, whatever, whatever the um, emotional injury is, um, you know, from with our mothers, whenever I speak of it, because I'm acknowledging it, that it exists, and I'm allowing you to even think of it, <laughs> whereas the majority of people don't want you to even do that, there is a release of the emotion, some of the emotion itself. But there is going to be a lot of emotional work that needs to be done for many people about their mothers. In fact, as I'm saying, a lot more than their fathers, no matter what anybody thinks. And it's basically because our mothers spend probably 80% or more of the time during our formative years with us than our fathers do in, con in current society. The reality is our fathers go off to work, usually in your society, by 6 or 7 in the morning, they're, they're gone. And, you know, the rest of the family really doesn't see them until they get home, you know, 10 hours later, generally. And, and then, you know, they want to tune out and zone out, the fathers do generally, because of the feeling tired or whatever it is. And as a result, a lot of children never get to spend a huge amount of time with their fathers. And so, therefore, they also never get a huge amount of emotional injuries from them. Right? And for many, aside from the feelings of being neglected and unwanted and unloved, you know, they're the general ones that many feel with their fathers. Um, with their mothers, it's a lot more complicated because they feel loved and they feel wanted from their mothers. But at the same time, their mothers often have a large amount of codependent addictions with their children, a lot of uh, what you would classify as belief systems that are imposed by the mother onto the child and so forth. And a lot of your problems in your second chakra are about your willingness to agree with your mother of about a lot of her belief systems in order to compromise yourself. And you compromise yourself doing so. The reason why this area frees up is because you feel a strong desire to tell her, but you don't feel like you can. Is that not correct? Yeah. So, so sometimes you get enough courage to tell her, and then there's what a fight or an argument or her detunement, usually one of those things. And so, um, yeah, you can speak. Uh, Mary's got the light, light back on. Yeah, uh, yeah generally... Um, Just hold it a bit up. I actually, I, I, I thought it was very positive because I did go back to live with my mom yeah. at this time. Yeah. And uh, I've been seeing loads of really positive changes in her as well as the rest of the family because I've been doing so much work uh, on myself. And I, I thought that was very positive. Yeah. And yeah, uh, generally what happens... If it's something that, that she's not ready to deal with, she'll just get very angry at me and I'll tell her that that's not uh, appropriate and I'll remove myself from the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a deep underlying fundamental beliefs about being a woman that you're not facing about all yeah. of these matters, right? <laughs> and um, how many of you ladies don't want to be like your mothers? <laughs> Almost all of you. It's interesting in itself, isn't it? Like how much emotion... That we have. See, if, if we really admired our mothers and respected our mothers and thought they were beautiful people and everything really at the core level, we'd probably want to be like them or similar to them in terms of qualities. So the fact that the majority of us don't um, is probably an indication that there, you know, there's quite a lot of stuff we need to deal with with our mothers. So. Um, uterus type of problems related to... Um, your womanhood, if I can call it that. Um, and these kind of problems often are deeply related to how you see women. And, and this, of course, is related to how you see your mother in, in, in many cases. And if there's tumours resulting, are they cancerous in nature or are they just no, benign? Um, if there's tumours, benign is a, like an... If it's benign, then it's just a, a growth if you like, that's occurring that's ha harmless in one sense. Uh, it can, they can be harmful, obviously, but they're harmless in one sense in that they're not eating away yourself, which is a lot of what causes things like cancerous tumours. But rather, 
they are a growth that's indicating to you that there's something wrong in the way you see your own womanhood and how you display it. So I would look in those directions. Yeah. But focus on this relationship with your mother more. Because yeah. every time I spoke with your... Uh, are, they, are you friends? No? Never met each other before? Hmm. Um, every time I spoke to Kathleen about her mother, um, there was this <gasps> acknowledgement inside of you, <laughs> which is pretty... you could feel fairly strongly, which means that you are not allowing yourself to acknowledge these things in day-to-day -day life. So I would suggest to you that you need to allow yourself to see the truth about your mother more than you have done so far. It is correct, though, that what you say is correct, that the more you work on yourself, the more things around you change and people do respond differently. But the main reason why she's responding differently is because she's feeling less rage from you. But, so that's the main reason why she's responding differently. It's not because of necessarily anything that she's personally dealt with. Thank anyway, you. it's 10 to 6, so I've probably got one more question perhaps and then I'd have to finish off. If we, Is there somebody who hasn't asked the question before? I don't think... Uh, no, if we come in front of you, Amanda, put up a hand. I don't think you've asked a question in this session, have you? No, fire away, Amanda, and I'll... That's okay. Will now? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's quite a confrontational question for me to ask, actually, because mm -hmm. it's about something that happened, say, an hour ago, half an hour ago, right. which was the Glastonbury tour thing, and you misheard it as Thor, and what happened to me was I went into a panic yeah. that there was going to be, and actually I felt I wasn't the, I felt it was in the room, yeah. that there was going to be an embarrassing misunderstanding, and then worse... That, that you'd somehow get it wrong and then my bubble would be burst and, and it would all collapse. And, and, and this is because you desire Jesus to be right all the time. Yes, and <laughs> that it is actually true, you know. And, and then what happened to me was I lost my energy and this is what happens to me a lot. I, I mm -hmm. suddenly felt very despondent and lost energy. And actually when I went to the loo, when I was in the loo, I had this really angry feeling of like, I don't want to be here anymore. And yeah. da la 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 And... And it was very much connected to this potential, this terror of embarrassment, but also a terror that you would be exposed somehow and yep. it would all come crashing down. Yeah, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> always must be right. Yes. If I could tell you how many times I've heard this yeah. over my last 2,000 years of existence... <laughs> The, the whole reason why the Christian faith said that I was God is because they wanted me to always be right. Yeah. I am not always right. Yeah. Get used to it. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm not always right is quite obvious. Only God is always right. And I am not God. Now, why do we want somebody to be always right? <laughs> Sometimes I do, but I didn't. <laughs> so why, why do we want people to be, always be right? You. No, why do we want someone, someone. other than yourself <laughs> yeah, to I, be always I'm right? right. Um, why do you want that? Well, that sense of being able to rely on somebody that they're going to... Yeah, it's be, all, isn't it? Be, There's a lot I mean, maybe of stuff sort of in it, isn't earlier it? Earlier, what you were saying about, you know, the whole idea of Jesus, that sense of salvation, somebody's going to sort it out for you in some so, way, I suppose. It's that relying on somebody. Okay, so it's a, it gives us a feeling of safety. Yes. Security. Yes. What else does it give us? Um. There's a lot of things that it, it helps us avoid. Yeah, because it's like I had such a panic that it was yes, all going yes. to... So you had deep fears about it. Yeah. I agree. So, but what does it help you avoid? You, you being right, if I'm always it? right, what does it help you avoid? Uh, taking responsibility for the decision. Ah, yourself. yes. Taking responsibility. Yeah. Responsibility. Hmm. 
And is that connected to why I lost energy? For your own, for your own life. It helps yeah, you avoid yeah. that. Because you can go, oh, but Jesus told me that. Yeah, yeah. And it, that's why I did it. It's all his fault that it's all <laughs> wrong now, right? Yeah, yeah. You can say that, right? Because yeah. you, you're abdicating self-responsibility. Now, in a way, what you want is a cult leader. Because a cult leader will do that for you. Yeah. I think you'd be much more popular if you were a cult leader. Yeah, yeah no, I know. <laughs> but, but I'm not a cult leader. Yeah, it's a shame. <laughs> I'm just a guy going around, travelling around the world, yeah, yeah. sharing truth with people. Yeah. And, and in some cases, uh, as it is when I analyse people's personal issues, it's my opinion. Yeah. And sometimes my opinion will be... Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's going to be wrong. Yeah. And, and you've got to look at why you want it to always be right. I'm not embarrassed when I'm wrong. Yeah, you see, I was. I was like, and I, I, ju- I, I, I don't know if anybody else felt it. I, I felt that there was a kind of, oh my God, we're going to, yeah. and then, oh, no, thank God, it's all right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm not embarrassed when I'm wrong. I think, well, oh, there's a good learning experience. Why was I wrong? Oh, it might have been because of this or that or whatever it was yeah. that I felt at the time, right? And I can analyze that myself and work my way through the issue. Also, the fact is that God is infinite and God knows the infinite truth. That being the case, and I'm a finite creation of God growing, yeah. right, in my relationship with God, there is never going to be a time in my future where I'm always right. Yeah. Now, you can always love while at the same time being wrong. Yeah. Be very careful that you don't see one basic truth, and this is this. And it's, worth, it's worth writing on the board, so I'll write it. The basic truth is this. The only real mistake (coughs) is to not love. What I see people doing today is they think a lack of knowledge is a mistake. A lack of knowledge isn't a mistake. All of us in the universe have a lack of knowledge aside from God. How can it be a mistake? It's not a mistake. God's created this infinite universe so that we have a lack of knowledge and a desire to gain more knowledge. It makes life interesting, in fact. That's the reason why God created it that way. A lack of knowledge is not the problem. It's the lack of love that is our problem. That is the only real mistake that we can engage, a lack of love. And, and what I see people doing with me in particular, because oh, I'm Jesus and so I have to be God, right? So in a way, you want, me to have, you want me to be the Christian ideal of Jesus, which is Jesus is God. <laughs> I was going to say, ironically, since I'm not a Christian, but yes, ironically, maybe that's... You, know. you were an atheist and you want yes, that, yes. right? <laughs> you know, Work that out. Ways, yeah. But this is what often happens, right? Is that we, 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 we don't realise how much what we want is driven by our own unhealed emotional desires. So it's got nothing to do with who I am, really. It's got everything to do with what emotions in you you want. This guru-type Jesus that you want to create is going to give you. If you just leave it on, babe. It's do, do, okay. I was going to say, does that come back to the issue of will, then, this sense of response? Like, I'm, well, I want, I'm sort of handing my will over to you. Is that what I'm you, doing? You want to hand your will, and this is, what have, this is how cult leaders get created, is that you have a group of people who want to hand over their will to a person... And the reason why they want to hand over their will to a person is because when they hand over their will to the person, they get to avoid responsibility, personal responsibility. That's why they do it. And and this is why there is a large growth of cults on the planet, including religious cults, political cults, and all sorts of different... And gurus and all those kind of things. The reason why there is such a large growth in all of those areas is because of one reason, and that is... We want them. Yeah. And the reason why we want them is because they help us avoid personal responsibility. We can just sit there and go, what do you want, what, what do you want me to do now? And they tell you what to do and you go, no worries. Yeah. And then when it all goes pear-shaped and it all goes wrong in our personal life, we say, yeah, that, was a, that person was a bastard. 
We should, you know... You don't realise you're doing it. You don't realise you're in this process. Of exactly, you don't. And what I'm suggesting to you is the only mistake you can make is to not love. Yeah. So don't be worried about making mistakes <laughs> other than emotion. not loving. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so let yourself go through your life discovering things and experimenting with things and realise that you're allowed to make mistakes because yeah. you're not, you don't know everything. No. Right? And you're never going to know everything. No. Ever. <laughs> and what no. we often want is we want somebody who knows everything so that we don't have to take personal responsibility for our mistakes. And the reason why yes. we do that is because we're afraid of being punished for yes. our mistakes. Yes. But God does not punish no. you for your mistakes. No. God only <laughs> corrects you or there is a penalty mm. or consequence on your soul when you don't love. Yeah. yeah. When you make the choice to not love, that's the time when there's going to be a penalty on salt. Not when you make any other mistake. You're yeah. allowed to have a mistake in knowledge. You're allowed to believe the wrong things. You're allowed to do all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. And God's not going to punish any of those things. And in fact, you might not even have a negative result from any of those things. Yeah. But when you choose to not love, you will always have yeah. a negative result in your life, a negative result in the lives of people around you and so forth. And not taking responsibility in itself is unloving. Exactly. It's a demand not, on you to exactly. be in that role. Wanting somebody else, yeah. no matter who it is, Jesus, yeah. God, you know, some guru, whatever, wanting somebody else to take control or responsibility for your life is an unloving projection on that yeah. person. Yes, you now, to my credit, I don't do it <laughs> right with yeah. you. Yeah. But a lot of other people, see you guys, a lot of other people would. Yeah. And this is how whole organisations get created and cults yeah. get created. And this is how like 900 people die in mass suicides yeah. by, by the giving away of their will and the giving away of their responsibility to other people. So my suggestion is don't do that. <laughs> right? okay. don't, don't do that. <laughs> Honour the fact that the only real mistake you can make is to love. Anything else you view as a mistake isn't a mistake from God's perspective, and you need to work through the emotional reason why you believe it's a mistake. Yeah. And we need to work through the emotional reasons why we feel, you know, like if we make a mistake, we're going to be hurt by somebody or punished by somebody or so forth. These are all childhood things that happen to us. They've got nothing to do with our relationship with God. Mm. Yeah. And I am going to be wrong. Okay. You need to get used to it. I bear that in mind. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be wrong too, by the way. Yeah, get yeah, used to yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there will be people you meet who obviously know a lot more than you do about life, about God's laws, about God's... Because they've been wrong many times in the past and worked their way through all of that, right? Yeah. And found out more of God's truth. Yeah. They're worth listening to, yeah. but understand they also have their own opinions. And they're allowed to have their own opinions and some of their opinions will be wrong. Yeah. Right? This is why your relationship with God is so important. It's only God that can actually correct all of these things in you. Yeah. So Jesus can't do it, nor can any other person do it. And yeah. if you expect them to do it, then you're out of harmony with love. Yeah. Because the way God created is God and you. Between God and you, everything can be sorted. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps that's a good place to leave our discussion okay. today. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So we, we'd like to, uh, Mary and I would like to thank you for your time today and also the fact that uh, you responded in a very short period of time to our, um, our uh, advertising, I suppose you would call it, on our website about uh, this event occurring. And uh, thank you too for your donations that you've given us today. With regard to just packing up afterwards, if you wouldn't mind ch stacking the chairs in gr fives, and we'll just put them around the edge on the side. With the technical gear, I'll have to do a lot of that because I have to be the one that unpacks it next, so I've got to know where everything is. So, um. Oh, yes. Oh, one other thing I'd like to mention is that from Australia, there were a lot of people who wanted to give you their love and greetings, and Lena and Igor in particular, who do all of our videos for us, uh, wanted to thank many of you for your donations to them, and, uh, and for your interest in the videos and so forth as well. So if you could accept their thanks along with ours, that would be fantastic. Thanks, guys. Please yep. give them ours. And we don't know when we're going to catch up with you next, so um, I, I doubt whether it's going to be this year, to be frank, because we've got uh, a number of uh, trips planned throughout near to the end of the year, to the end of November at this point. 
So um, I don't think you'll see us, except perhaps on telly. Um, we've got some uh, documentaries being made at the moment by British people, and uh, you may finish up seeing them on BBC or Channel 4 or something like that um, in the future. I don't know how they're going to turn out because we don't control those things, but uh, that's possibly the only place where you'll see us aside from our own YouTube channel. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Eh? Thank you. Yeah.